sensitive aviation gadgets positioned in the area cannot function effectively because of the encroachment. There's more in this report. The presence of the structures is considered as an interference in the work of the aviation authorities, which could trigger accidents. Early attempts by the aviation sector to evict all encroachers have been met with stiff opposition as affected people have insisted on due compensation. But speaking at the Meet the Press session today, the aviation minister Cecilia Dapai explained that the outfits will ensure all structures within the critical zones are cleared. We saw structures and I openly said they should be pulled down if they are found in the critical uh, areas that they don't need to be. I believe assessment has been done per the last briefing. Um, we are working with AMA, the Lands uh, Commission, to see which ones. We have three colors, and the, there's a white area, the red zone, and the blue. And all these carry certain structures that can be allowed. So we are in the process of assessment and uh, whichever structure that is found within any authorized area will be pulled down. The Ministry of Roads and Highways, together with the police service this morning, embarked on an exercise to evict squatters around the Accra Tema roundabout. The eviction exercise is to pave way for the construction of the roundabout interchange, which has delayed because of the refusal of some of the squatters to relocate. The $60 million three-tier interchange is to ease traffic on the Accra Flower Highway and the Tema Kosombo Road, which intercept each other at the Tema Motorway Roundabout. City News' Philip Nilate has more in this report. The exercise, which began in the early hours of this morning, had traders, food vendors and drivers of public vehicles stranded as bulldozers ran through their structures. The squatters were ordered by the police to leave the site to avoid being hurt. Some petty traders along the runabout who dashed to the scene packed a few of their belongings. Though several notices of eviction have been served to these quarters, they believe government could have made available alternative spaces for them to move to. Yeah, the Ministry of Roads and Highways, on the other hand, said ample time was given to the squatters to relocate, but a few refused to heed to the directive. According to the sector minister, Kwesi Amwakwata, the construction of the three-tier interchange cannot be delayed, hence the need for the forceful eviction. This exercise which took off at dawn is being carried out by my ministry through the Ghana Highway Authority in conjunction with uh, the police uh, service uh, to make sure that we hand over total vacant possession to the contractors who are undertaking the construction of the three-tier interchange. Officially, in my speech, I did give notice that we were giving them another two weeks, failure of which the authority of the state will be invoked. And that is what is taking place now. I'm happy that it's going on smoothly. The police had been here in full force and they are acting professionally and it's important we do that in the sense that in the agreement this project is supposed to commence and finish within 28 months and it is the first phase then the second phase will start but there is a cross in the agreement that 
any extra costs will be borne by the party you know that causes any delay and here the parties are the, the employer is the government of ghana and the contractors from japan the project which is expected to be completed in two years will be executed by master shimizu dai nimpon joint ventures with cti engineering international company limited as consultant it has been funded with a grant by japanese international cooperation agency jica today's demolition exercise came as a surprise to squatters around the Temaran about, though they've been cautioned several times by the Ministry of Roads and Highways to relocate. For City News, Philip Nielate. Now in a related development, squatters at Agbobulushi and New Abuja in Accra have only a month to vacate their structures. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly says the grace period is to allow further engagements with the squatters before the demolition begins. So far, 434 out of the over 1,000 structures have been marked for phase one of the demolition exercise, which will take place in September. My colleague Kojajman has been following this story. A protest to secure where they lay their heads. For the over 4,000 residents of New Abuja and Abubloshi, they will resist attempts by the AMA to pull down their homes numbering over 1,000. The young, the old, male and female here are worried about the intended exercise which is expected to take place in September. Though the clock is ticking, they say they have not been seriously engaged by the AMA. They only woke up to see markings on their structures. For Joel Ajay, a drugstore owner, an engagement would have allowed them to plan their next move. When they came, they said uh, on the 15th of next month, we should just move. For now, uh, it is a bit uh, worrying. We don't know where to go. As, as we are talking to you now, I don't know where to go now. Because when I turn my head and left and right, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to go. Actually, I don't know where to go. New Abuja and Abubloshi lie behind Accra Brewery Limited. For the over 4,000 residents who live in this slum, most of them are petty traders, artisans, hairdressers, drivers, and laborers. While others are seriously wondering their next move, others are not perturbed by the warning from the AMA. For Isaka Ni Ayikwe Hammond, the fact that the AMA has been collecting property tax from them legitimizes their stay here. From AMA, Niji property rent. Mokonone, Yeni, Aba Makina Kabakumu, Ni Sabita Flache, Kaji, Moko Yehekopo, Noke O Fale, Ni. Rooms the head of communication at the AMA, Gilbert Ni Ankara, says the assembly is engaging as quarters for a smooth process. We, we know that engagement will go a long way to mitigate the resistance and that is what we are doing we've engaged them we've met with their leaders but but of course you would have some one or two of them who who who, who would not want to move one way or the other but we are engaging them and we are still in the process of engaging them we've given them a one month period and within them one month period we are hopeful that with the level of engagement it, 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 it there will be some form of understanding for the assembly to move ahead with whatever we want to do next month the Accra metropolitan assembly will demolish all these structures according to residents here it is to pave way for the construction of a tomato market mind you a similar incident at old fadama in june 2015 led to rioting reporting for city news from agubloshi in Accra. my name is kojo ajaman
Let's get to Tema now, where the Tema Metropolitan Assembly has asked companies within the Ghana Free Zones enclave to disregard demands for property taxes from the Don Katamansu Municipal Assembly. This follows the tussle between Ghana Free Zones Board and the Don Katamansu Municipality over the non payment of the tax. According to the Mayor of Tema, Felix Mensa Ni Anandla, the companies must rather pay the monies to the TMA. There are over 50 companies within the Free Zones Enclave at the Tung Katamansu Municipal Assembly. For a long time now, these companies have failed to pay their property taxes. Not even constant reminders from the Assembly will make them pay. Solomon Apia is the MCE for the Assembly. There is no property anywhere that you say, I have this and I have been exempted from paying my property rate. Churches are paying their property rate. Everybody is supposed to pay the property rate. We are even not collecting the BOP from them, business operating permits, because they are working with the free zone. We allow that one. If free zone is not collecting the business operating, we will add it to ours and, and pick it. And that is what we are creating the awareness for everybody to understand that we need these tasks to develop the municipalities to complement the efforts of what the central government is doing. But the Ghana Free Zones insists that the Assembly has no right to demand the tax. Here is the Executive Secretary of the Authority, Michael Oche Befi. You cannot just enter my territory and come and tell my staff to sit down. So, so in, in come to us. Let's have discussion. You have done that. And we told you to hold on. We're going to have a discussion with them. We'll talk. You can't write to them without our knowledge. You are writing to them to do what? What right do you have to write to them? What is your low cost? Tell us. What, what's a clout? I mean, you on, on, on the whole basis that you are writing to the free zones enterprises without the free zones authority, it's not done anywhere. The mayor of Tema, Felix Mensa Ni Ananla, has also asked the companies to disregard the demands of the Tung Katamansu Municipal Assembly. Yes, I want to advise all companies within the free zone area who already pay property taxes to TME should continue to do that. Go ahead and continue to pay to TME. That is where they belong. And so the substantive issue waiting to be resolved at the RCC and the local government ministry. That was what bring these issues up. That uh, they are thinking that the place is for them and they want to take the entire place. And we also say, you know, it doesn't belong to you. The companies over there knows TMA collect those taxes from there. And they, they have been dealing with them. So when letters started coming from Po, that they shouldn't pay to TMA again, they were confused. So they wrote to us to clarify some of the issues when people are raising. And we also wrote back to them. And inform them that the place still fall within the Tema Metropolitan Assembly. Reporting for City News from the Tung Katamansu Municipality here in Accra, my name is Ni Ama Ama. And I have been joined by Jeffrey Turing Cancer. He's the lead petitioner of the concerned residents of Tung Katamansu to give us his thoughts on the latest developments and maybe figure out what the way forward is for them. Jeffrey, hi, welcome and uh, welcome to the City Newsroom. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, your initial reaction to the response from the, the Ghana Free Zones Authority, the Free Zones Board. Yes. Well, I find the comments of the Executive Secretary very alarming. Because he speaks of locals, he speaks of the, the Metropolitan Municipal Assembly not yes. having that remit. This is clearly a misunderstanding of our local government structure. Okay. I would like to put to him that he should let us know where within the Local Government Act 9963, Section 144, Section 152, section 158 okay. or section 166 which clearly spells out how property rates should be taken and the procedure and processes the local assembly to go through where does it state that um, the local assembly should consult an agency of government before they do so nowhere should any of the 216 districts within this country consult an agency of government before they take these levies that's number one. 
Number two, a court judge judgment was obtained by the assembly mm -hmm. from a high court in Tema dated the 25th of April 2018. And what did the judgment say? The judgment clearly spe spells out that one, the companies were supposed to pay these property taxes, which mm -hmm. are levies given by the assembly to Uncatamanso Municipal Assembly as, as much as they fall within their jurisdiction. Okay. So really, I believe that Mr. Berfi does not really understand the local government structure of our country. If he did, he wouldn't be saying these things. Again, I would also like to state on record that my checks with the assembly shows that the petition we sent to the office of the senior minister, yes. they have received um, communication from the senior minister that he's arranging a meeting to meet them. So for us, this is welcoming news. And okay. we're looking forward to the fact that this um, certainty will be brought to the matter and the matter will be resolved clearly. Oh, Jeffrey, why, why do you think there's so much confusion as to who these property rates are to be paid to? Is it a matter of the, the physical siting of uh, the, the entities in the free zone enclave, i.e. whether or not they fall under Don Catamanso or TMA? Why do you think there's this confusion? Because clearly the companies feel that they need to be paying to one entity while you, the residents, feel that it needs to come towards the, the, the district under which you, you, you fall? Well, clearly, Nathan, um, I believe that the call by the TMA chief executive is also mischievous. Why do I say that? It's public knowledge out there when you read the 2010 Housing and Population mm -hmm. Census. I would like to direct everybody to the section that refers to local and district assemblies. Okay. Section 1.5 clearly states that the free zones falls under Pum Katamanso Municipal Assembly. Again, for the benefits of viewers and even people who like to verify, I am not a member of the Assembly, but documentation I have intercepted from the Assembly clearly shows that earlier the disputes between TMA and KKMA had to do with the Tema industrial area where the railway lines usually pass through okay and that was around the tall area so areas close to the Tema motor runabout areas properly within the free zones it didn't, didn't even fall within the purview so 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 the so the issue with the free zones is, is very clear that yes. whoever is in that free zones needs to pay property rates to a designated um, um municipal authorities and that's very clear you're saying correct. it's don't cut man, so that correct. should be getting that correct so what will you do now now that there seems to be this tussle and free zones at least from the response we've heard seem to also have their own cause of action or they seem to have an entrenched position what will you do now well we're hoping that we would we would hear from that engagement that is going to go on ahead at the office of the senior minister because he was the one we appealed to okay. but clearly we believe that the court judgment that the assembly obtained on the 25th of April, all these matters are irrelevant. And we hope that by the time the senior minister would have sat the two entities down, he is going to also point out to the Free Zones Executive Secretary Michael Berthy that really, as per local government act and as per the rule of law in this country, you cannot sideline the courts. The courts okay. are actually what guide our constitution. So if a court has ruled, that it means we must all follow the dictates of the court. This meeting, have you been invited or do you know of this officially? Because I know you wrote to the office of the senior minister. Um, have you received any response hinting of this meeting and whether or not you will be invited to sit in that uh, interaction? Well, it was my checks at the, at the okay. local assembly that showed that they had been contacted. Okay. And to us, that's fine. Okay. Once this matter is resolved and clearly it is shown that the companies must pay, it would actually accelerate the process for us okay. because once the court judgment was declared it meant that the companies were supposed to pay so we hope that once that engagement takes place it would accelerate the process it is something that what is bound to happen it's just a matter of time all right thank you very much jeffrey for your time so that was jeffrey turing because i is lead petitioner of the concerned residents of pung kataman so who are trying to get property rates paid to the right authority so that that particular part of ghana can access funds and get through with some major development work you're still watching the city newsroom live on city tv my name is nathan kwa we'll take a short break when we come back we'll find out why residents of taqwa and swayem wants the mineral revenue management law passed immediately don't go anywhere
regular news checks as they unfold. 2020 News, all day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business and more. 2020 News, we bring you the world in 20 minutes. And that's all the news in 20 minutes. We spice up your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation. Because we're giving only those in their third trimester. So in the next three months, those in their second would be ready for to receive the kits. And we're taking data at registration, which is before they take the kits, at delivery and post-delivery, so that we can analyze. And we'll see the numbers. So from the numbers and the data, that we're collecting we would know what has worked what hasn't worked you know join the breakfast daily team monday through fridays from 7 30 a.m to 10. let your voice be heard with the hashtag breakfast daily join us for breakfast daily only on city tv Welcome back to the City Newsroom. Let's get to some other stories. And hundreds of prospective National Service personnel hoping to undertake their registration have lamented the slow nature of the process. According to them, they have remained in long queues for weeks now, but have not been able to get anywhere close to registering in order to be eligible for service, which is expected to begin soon. City News' Nash Shikat Caesar has more in this report. This year's registration for prospective National Service personnel has proven cumbersome, tiresome and stressful like happened last year. Hundreds of frustrated prospective National Service personnel lament that the exercise has become a huge source of inconvenience to them because they have to travel long distances and spend a lot of money on transportation. To make matters worse, they are made to wait in long queues in the sun at the registration centers. Some of the frustrated students say they have been reporting to the regional office of the Secretariat as early as 2 a.m. each day since last week. But due to the unduly slow process, they have still not been registered. First, I came from Wa to Accra and I was not able to do it because they said the system has reposted me back to Sunyani. So I'm supposed to go back to Sunyane. Then I went to Sunyane. Then they said I should come back to Accra, the main office. It's very stressful and the transportation fee, it's, it's too much. So I'm hoping maybe next time they will make the system easy for us from afar. I came here and I saw a whole lot of queues. So I just asked how things are going. They said um, the 10 o'clock, those who booked for 10 o'clock, will join the queue that's 15 minutes uh, before the time but i feel like things are quite moving mm. uh, when i went to the original place they gave me a letter for repost and i went to the district office they said we should go to the district office before coming here so i went there not knowing they did not send the letter here so i came in and then they said i should print out a form i printed it out and then submitted it but till now it's not come so today uh, by hook or hook i'm waiting for them if they don't do it for me i'm not going on is it that we all sleep in the same office or <laughs> I, it's, not, it's not as if I'm trying to uh, say I'm going to cause a commotion or something, but it's becoming unbecoming. People have waited for close to like a month and a half or so, but still nothing. Whereas some people even come, I don't, I don't know if it's luck or something. Some people even come just one day and it's done for them. I don't know. All efforts to get a reaction from the authorities at the Secretariat proved futile. Reporting for City News, I am Nashika Caesar. Let's get to the western region where residents of Takwa and Suayim, a municipality where uh, gold and manganese are mined heavily in that area, are calling on the Coastal Development Authority to include their development plans in its coastal regions program. According to a natural resource governance analyst, the development concerns of residents in Takwa and other mining communities will only be properly addressed 
If the mineral revenue management law is passed, my colleague in the Western region is Akwesi Ejeenim, and he has more details in this report. Takwa Inswaye Municipality is iconic for its rich mineral resources. It currently hosts major gold mining companies, including Goldfields Takwa Mines, Anglo Gold Idwapri Mines, as well as Ghana's only manganese mine at Nsuta. Despite this, the Takwa Inswaye Municipality is bedeviled with many development concerns, such as this poor road, which is a common sight across the municipality. You cannot come from Accra or Takwadi to Takwa, which is a very major mining community, without using this very bad road, also used by these manganese and bauxite trucks. But the good news is that Takwa is expected to also benefit from the Coastal Development Authority, and I'm therefore here to find out from residents as to whether they think their plight is likely to change under the Coastal Development Authority. Authority no mose omo ati no. Ohun, ye pese ye hun se eye djuma. Enye se Accra, Kumasi Takwa de nko a. Takwa ye wo bibia bi wo ha se. Scania na ade on we so omo de de omo omo de boaga na ni na omo de fi ha. But end of the day no mo se ye Takwa fo no. Ye bre ye bre pa. What you say? Nti aban no wan hwe na Takwa kwa no wan ye bibia ma ya. 2020 be tun se akoko. Mr. Bibri, say, Kwani, you more than I saw by my. The son says, Is your woodman, no, I had been a pa. May any man, my bread is your woodman, a macatach, your cry, your woo, the ascending Bibri, some wire pa, non ya quani, of my and ye woo pa. Is a young worse penamoja. If indeed the government has created the Coastal Development Authority and Takwa is part of it, then I will. I will uh, compare the government to as a matter of uh, urgency to ensure that this road is done. The municipal development planning officer for Takwa in Siam says the mineral royalty allocation that comes back to the municipality for aid development is inadequate. Though we have the mineral varieties to support or the MDF to also support the activities, it is not quite enough. If you look at the challenges of Takwa in Swahili Municipal Assembly, there are so many due to the influx of people into the municipality for mining related activities. We have a higher population and this comes with demand for uh, many or more social infrastructure is the busy nature of the the place we have bad roads we have uh, big or long vehicles plying our heavy duty vehicles plying our roads and as i speak now all our roads are very poor they are in a deplorable condition that we need to uh, work on them but the natural resource governance coordinator at the friends of the nation believes the solution is with the promised mineral revenue management law. We need to widen the scope and have a comprehensive mineral revenue management law, which will be a semblance of what we have in the petroleum sector, where all revenues that accrue to the states get into a holding fund and they are disbursed in an agreed ratio and also in proportions that aligns to the priorities of the citizenry, especially those who live in the mining communities and those who feel the most impact of mining. From this beautiful gold mining site at Takwa, I am Kweshe Jenim for City News. Association of Freight Forwarding Associations operating at the Tema Port have declared that they will lay down their tools come Monday the 27th of August if government fails to scrap the cargo tracking note. According to them, the system, when introduced, would increase the cost of doing business at the port. This was made known at a joint press conference organized by some freight forwarding associations at the port. The associations include the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders, GIF, Association of Custom House Agents of Ghana, Custom Brokers Association of Ghana, Quebec, and some other stakeholders at the port. Now, we have been joined in the studio by the President for Chamber of Freight and Trade, Dennis Amfusefa, to tell us more and to make us understand these things better. Thank you very much for your time. Welcome to City News Room. Thank you very much. So quickly tell us a little bit about the, um, the cargo tracking note. Well, um, <clears throat> let me give you a brief history mm. about cargo tracking. After 9-11, the United States government decided to uh, introduce new protocols to track cargo from their point of origin, 
before it enters the United States of America. So they brought what we call the um, cargo security initiative, mm. that every cargo that will be loaded, bound to the USA, would have to be tracked from its port of loading before it gets there. Even before the vessel sets sail, the authorities in the United States would have to be informed on what cargo the, the vessel is carrying, uh, the type of commodity, the value, and its classification. Mm. So along the line of where a year, I think the International Maritime Organization realized that um, cargo tracking that was being um, undertaken by the United States was shocking success. So they met and adopted the, the new ISPS and also invited World Customs Organizations that well, they should come and help them to, to discuss this issue and also um, urgently urge members to develop their own cargo tracking note or a way to track cargo from its uh, origin port to a destination. So as we speak now, even in the European Union, they have a 24-hour rule. Before you load a cargo uh, and the ship set seals, the port, of the port of loading must send all information about the cargo to the port of destination. What government seeks to do is to tell us that, simple, my, my brothers and sisters, before you ship your cargo, from China, America, or Europe, forward me all documentation on your containers. This came to being when, um, over a couple of years, customers have been complaining that documentation that has been submitted to them for process has been conducted, and um, the authenticity of those documents cannot be confirmed. So uh, they were finding ways to, to verify documents that agents and importers submit to them. Along the line, somewhere last two, three years, Customs started implementing what we call the, uh, 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 what is it, what is it, what is it, uh, uh, the benchmark value. Hmm. What the benchmark value seeks to do is that whatever commodity you are bringing into this country should fall within a price range, hmm. which freight forwarders thought that it wasn't fair. Because on the international market, you cannot tell me that you bought a commodity for this price so therefore i should also buy it at the same price maybe i'm buying in large quantities so i can negotiate and get a lower rate than you are so we told customs that we don't accept now customs is telling us that simple my brothers give me the document from source mm -hmm. so why are we fighting customs over it so what 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 system is currently in place currently what we have is that the importer gives the freight for other documents and we then present to customs okay so there's a human interface and a human intervention mm -hmm. between the the importer the agent and customs now customs says no give me the document from source but is this still not the same person going to take the documents Thank to you. customs you know what happens currently we have an arrangement with the indian customs so when you have a shipment coming from India, they will quote a number which is called the shipping BL number on the bill of lading. So Ghana Customs, even though you present a bill of lading and another invoice to them, would not work with yours. They will just go onto their system, input that number that Indian custom has given them. They would get accurate information about your cargo. So what customs seek to do with CTN is that apart from the invoice that you, you upload on the platform, you would also ask, upload the export document, the custom export document from your port, the port of loading. Mm. That is documents to show value, classification, and the security risk of whatever commodity you have in the container. In terms of cost, how is this going to help? Because some freight forwarding associations have decried that it's really going to increase the cost of doing business. How does this help? Oh, it, it is so surprising to me because... Listen, as, as we speak now, customs takes 1% processing fee for the CCVRs that they issue, which is a custom classification evaluation report. Customs is telling us that it's going to be free. They are going to find ways to absorb the, the cost of the CCTN with the 1% that they take for uh, CCVR issuance. So there's no cost element in there. Unless customs are going to tell us again, in the near future that they are going to charge for CTN. Mm. But my sister, 
look at the cost element, the benefit to Ghanaians for, for, for GRA, a revenue uh, authority, to have accurate data and information on commodities that are coming to Ghana, their value, and their duties that are to be collected. And the foregone conclusion that we wouldn't know. But how come you are the only association supporting this? Because we have GIF and um, the Quebec all against this. And you are the only association for this. Well, we believe that it is going to sanitize the system. Because we don't like the mischief that has been created out there. That freight forwarders are always doctrine or documents that they present to customs. So if we always claim that the documents we give to them are genuine, they are telling us, give us the document at source. So have you engaged your colleagues? For us, yeah. our, our, our members, we've, we've sensitized them and made them understand that this is even going to be in our favor. Then that quote that has always been on us, that, oh, as for freight forwarders, they are criminals, they temper with documents, they mm. all will be a thing of the past. Right, so we'll see how it goes. Thank you very much, Dennis, you. for your time. You. You're still watching City Newsroom live on City TV. Moving on, in light of recent increase in petroleum prices, the Chamber for Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, has called for a national dialogue to address what it calls the worrying trend of price increases. Major importers have also attributed the increase to the price movements on the international market and the performance of the city. But will the Energy Ministry and the NPA heed to this call? There is more in this news desk report. Over the weekend, fuel prices marginally increased by 2%. This means that a gallon of petrol that sold for 21.825 Ghana cities as at Friday will now sell for 22.27 Ghana cities. City News Checks indicates that fuel prices have increased by 9% in all since the beginning of this year. After remaining generally stable for four straight pricing windows, fuel prices increased by 2%. In an interview with City News, Executive Secretary for the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Duncan Amwa, who described these increases as a worrying trend, called on government for a national dialogue to discuss lasting solutions to the price hikes. He, however, threatened a demonstration with a two-week ultimatum if government does not act. A national dialogue is urgently needed uh, to discuss the way forward on the rampant fuel increases uh, that we seem to be experiencing. On one hand, uh, you a feeling uh, something is being done about it. On the other, uh, you also get the impression that uh, nothing is being done and that we are throwing our hands up in despair. Uh, should we stretch consumers to a point where their pockets can no longer bear? Uh, should we also have a discussion thoroughly on the performance of the CD? Uh, we are going to ask the Ministry of Energy to stay ahead this, uh, together with the NPA. If we get a sense that over the next uh, two weeks, nothing is done, uh, we would only prepare for a demonstration uh, going forward. In response, the Minister for Energy, John Peter Mewu, said calls for national dialogue is a step in the right direction. We should be able to engage them in that direction. That's not dialogue is proper. I think we can do that. So these are marginal increases. You know, the, the behavior of the upstream sector is quite interesting, which I think most consumers are aware. Uh, it's behavior of the crude oil. As of when the crude oil goes up, you know, the prices are the better tip. We have to reflect the changes in the international market. So this is just a marginal increase, about 2%. I mean, eventually, it's not expected. If you do a long-term projection, we don't expect this to continue. It is, however, not clear when, where, and how such a national dialogue will happen if at all government will convene it. Let's do some politics now. And the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, John Singh Asedun Kese, has issued a strong warning to persons vying for national positions in the party against insults and character assassination when campaigning. According to Mr. Asedun Ketia, the party's disciplinary committee will sanction anyone who falls foul of this directive. There's more in this report. The General Secretary of the NDC, who was addressing the media on modalities for the party's upcoming national executive elections, cautioned all potential aspirants who are seeking to contest the various positions to be wary of all forms of manslinging and vilification of opponents during the campaign. The NDC scribe indicated that the party won't mind expelling offenders of the regulations as part of the sanctions available to them. 
Any person or aspirant who flouts these regulations shall be subject to disciplinary action in accordance with the constitution of the party. The party has a strict disciplinary code embedded in our constitution. And there are punishments ranging from caution, verbal caution, written caution, suspension for a period, uh, prevention from holding of office to expulsion from the party. And so the disciplinary committee will weigh your offense and then prescribe the appropriate uh, punishment that goes with that offense. Mr. Siedun Ketia further announced the 20th of October as the date set for Congress where delegates of the party will elect new party executives. National Congress, 20th of October. It is at this Congress that all the other positions that are electable, with the exception of the youth and women's leadership, will be elected. And as I have indicated earlier on, before the National Congress, we would have elected, the youth conference would have taken place to elect the youth leadership, and the women's conference would have also taken place to elect the national uh, woman organizer and two deputy women organizers. We stay with the NDC and that party's flag bearer hopeful Alban Babin has touted his credentials saying he was responsible for grooming John Dramani Mahama to become president of Ghana. Mr. Babin says he nurtured the former president from his days in parliament till he became the Ghanaian leader in the year 2012. Speaking to delegates of the party in the Volta region as part of his campaign, the second deputy speaker of parliament said John Mahama cannot lead the NDC again. Alban Bagbin also slammed one of his challengers, Sylvester Mensa, saying the former NHIA CEO does not have the requisite experience for the job. Now, many of the accidents on our roads are as a result of reckless driving, mainly at zebra crossing points. However, the indiscriminate crossing of busy roads by pedestrians is largely to blame for this phenomenon. In the following report, City News' Akosia of Oaupoku explores the information in the public domain regarding the use of zebra crossings. As the stripes on the coat of the zebra, one cannot help but wonder why drivers hardly stop at this unique point for pedestrians to cross busy roads. Its use is as simple as ABC to allow moving vehicles stop for pedestrians to go from one side of the road to the other but many drivers do not seem to be aware or even respect this feature. Statistics from the National Road Safety Commission indicate that pedestrian fatalities constitute 42% of road traffic casualties annually. 68% of this figure occur while pedestrians are crossing roads. Some pedestrians tell me that crossing busy roads is always a struggle. One of the challenges I, I see that sometimes the location of the zebra crossing itself is wrong. Especially where I'm standing right now, it's a rich runabout. And the zebra crossing is just look, it, it's just position just immediately after the runabout. And I think it's wrong. It could have been distant a little bit from the runabout because as soon as the car make a curve and for a car to stop for it to cross, it could create a traffic within the runabout. And then the challenge is that um, the drivers are not even patient enough for you to even see you even standing at the river point to cross. When you want to cross the road, and cars are coming and you don't ask for permission to cross this, the road they don't mind you know they, they, they just cross if you are standing by the zebra crossing some of them will allow you but the church or drivers they, they don't they don't really allow you whenever you're crossing the road you always stand by zebra crossing if there's a zebra crossing that's where i cross the road please i walk to the zebra crossing to cross because it's it's important and some drivers don't mind when you are at another place if there's a zebra crossing nearby. According to the Road Traffic Act of 2004, it is an offense not to give precedence to a pedestrian on a zebra crossing. 
The pedestrian has no priority at a zebra crossing until he has stepped on it. And when he does, drivers must give way to him. But either drivers do not know this or totally disregard the law. Well, um, me, I know um, a pedestrian is vulnerable when he steps on the street. So anytime I get to the um, zebra crossing, I'm very, very careful how I move. I'm very, very patient because anything can happen. When I get there, I watch first to see if I, a pedestrian is there. If someone is there, I have to stop for the person to cross. These pedestrians are of the view that more public education is needed on the appropriate use of zebra crossings. Education about road signs are not been good enough in our, our country and should be intensified. At a zebra crossing, it is every driver's responsibility to give precedence to oncoming pedestrians. It is also every pedestrian's right to make sure that the driver has seen him or her ahead of time before he or she crosses. Reporting for City News, I am Akosia Ofewa Opoku. So, Prima, do you stop for people to cross? Well, I try, <laughs> you know, but you know how it is like in this country. I mean, sometimes you just drive past the zebra cross before you even yeah. notice that there were people there. there. People. So, we always apologize. No, I'm sorry, but then you cross, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you're still watching City Newsroom right here on City TV with me, Prima Dunyami and Nathan Kwa. We'll go for a short break. When we come back, we've got more stories for you. Don't go anywhere. and incisive analysis. It's The Big Issue, your preferred Saturday morning news and current affairs analysis program on City TV. Tune in this and every Saturday at 9 a.m. and hear the newsmakers discuss the top issues for the week. At that time, at that time, Charlotte was complex. I'm not defending Charlotte. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the way we are. We have like hypocrites and ostriches in this country. At that time, she was the, the perfect person. It's the biggest you with Sela Madonu on City TV this and every Saturday at 9 a.m. Welcome back to the City Newsroom live on City TV and let's get to some sad news. And the world was thrown into a state of shock over the weekend following news of the death of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Mr. Annan died in Switzerland after a period of short illness. Tributes are still pouring in for the late UN Secretary General. Here is City News Ni Ama Ama with the life and achievements of Kofi Annan. Dear friends and colleagues, Saying goodbye is never easy. I have spent most of my life working with the United Nations. In 2007, the late Kofi Annan delivered this speech addressed to staff of the United Nations after bringing his 10-year tenure as Secretary General to an end. After leaving the UN, Mr. Annan set up the Kofi Annan Foundation with its main focus on international development and peace. Now in its 10th year, the foundation has worked to promote global governance and champion the campaign for world peace. In 2008, he was appointed the Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Lagon, by the University Council. Kofi Annan was born in Kumasi in 1938. He received his early education at the Infant Spim School. 
After further studies, he joined the UN in 1962, working for the World Health Organization's Geneva office. He went on to work in several capacities at the UN headquarters, including serving as the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping between March 1992 and December 1996. Subsequently, he was appointed the Secretary General on 13 December 1996 by the Security Council and later confirmed by the General Assembly, making him the first office holder to be elected from the UN staff itself. Mr. Anand's death shocked many across the world. Back home in Ghana, President Ekufuado has directed that all flags fly at half-mast beginning today for five days. This is to Anna Kofi Annan, who he described as a true Ghanaian government has announced that it is meeting with the family of the late Kofi Annan on how best to give him a befitting burial. Here is the information minister designate Kojo Opong Nkuma. Today and tomorrow as well we're engaging with the family here. State protocol is to try engaging with the family so that we begin exploring how to ensure that we give him a befitting final farewell. A director at the UN Office of the Special Advisor on Africa, Patrick Hayford, who worked with Mr. Annan closely, says that he brought a lot of honor through his conduct at the UN. He raised the profile of Ghana and by the dignity and the quiet effectiveness with which he executed his mandate, he did great honor to Ghana. General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson Asiedun Kete, has also eulogized the late Kofi Annan, highlighting the impact of his work. I can describe Kofi Annan as an outstanding, well-class citizen. And so that may be my fitting description for Kofi Annan. Um, because I wasn't aware of his ill health, I received the news with shock because I wasn't expecting that he would depart anytime soon. And uh, upon sober reflection, I realized that the nation and indeed the world has lost an outstanding citizen. Kofi Annan has contributed so much to, uh, you know, peace in the world. <laughs> Indeed, the nation has lost the true son of the land and flying these flags at half-mast is only one of the ways we would continue to honor his memory. Reporting for City News from the Independence Square, my name is Ni Ama Ama. We're quite sad. We've lost a huge, huge personality. Yes, yes, and he will, in fact, forever be remembered because for me, I think that Kofi Annan rose through all the ranks, yeah. you know, to the very highest office of not just Ghana, international essentially politics, the world you know, absolutely. You can to, say that he was the president of the world yeah, trying at to a keep point. The peace, trying to, it's yeah. amazing how we seem to be losing the elders, you know, oh, of the land in, within a very short time. Judgments are now Kofi Annan. Well, we pray, we just for pray that no one will leave anytime <laughs> soon, you know. Well. Let's, let's get on to some other stories. And the first stage of City FM's literacy challenge has come to an end. The first stage involved the writing of essays by junior high school students on the topic, quote, the year is 2035. The law allows people below age 40 to contest for the presidency. You are a presidential candidate in the general election. In not less than 600 words, write your manifesto speech, end quote. After this stage, the top 50 students will move on to the next stage where they will write an aptitude test to propel them to the final stages of the competition. Head of events at City FM and City TV, Rastina Lee Yankee, tells City News names of the 50 qualified participants will be announced after the marking process. And that's it for the City Newsroom. Do visit citynewsroom.com for more news. Many thanks for your time. My name is Premier Duname. My name is Nathan Kwa. Do have a good night. For regular news checks as they unfold, 2020 news all day all the time politics sports entertainment business and more 2020 news we bring you the world in 20 minutes and that's all the news in 20 minutes 
We spice up your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation. Because we're giving only those in their third trimester. So in the next three months, those in their second would be ready for to receive the kit. And we're taking data at registration, which is before they take the kit, at delivery and post-delivery, so that we can analyze. And we'll see the numbers. So from the numbers and the data, that we're collecting, we would know what has worked, what hasn't worked, you know. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10.